Hello, and welcome to CS11, lecture number 14, in which we'll take our first look at arrays and vectors. In the past, we've talked about variable types such as int, double, and string, which each hold one single value. Arrays and vectors are very powerful variables that can hold a collection, or multiple values. A dozen, hundreds, thousands, even millions of values, all of which you can access through the name of that one array or vector. And that's a very powerful feature. Let's imagine a difference between getting mail at a house and an apartment. And in front of a house, you might have a mailbox, and there's a flag, and inside that mailbox, you can have one single value. For example, int x, and we'll give it an initial value. But in front of an apartment building, you might have a row of mailboxes. So here we have six mailboxes. And on a computer, arrays and vectors, containers, are indexed starting at zero. We also saw this with a string in which the first character position was zero. So arrays and vectors have that in common with strings. So here is the declaration of an array with six positions in it, and here are six positions. Each one of those positions then works like an ordinary integer variable. So just like x, and you can assign a value to it, or do arithmetic with it, and so on. To do that, you use the square brackets, and then you can get to any particular position. So here, a3 would put a 7 in position 3. Now, each one of these positions is just an ordinary integer variable, so it can only have one value. Now, both arrays and vectors share this same basic idea, that there's positions in there, they're all of the same type, they're indexed starting at zero. But the difference is that arrays are more primitive, so that makes them maybe easier to understand how they work, and vectors are more modern or more powerful which makes them maybe a little bit harder to understand how they work, but easier to use. One primary difference between arrays and vectors is that with arrays, you have to specify exactly how many positions you want, and with a vector, it, you don't have to do that. And with a vector, if you decide later on that you need more room, it will just take care of allocating for that. So imagine a, a magic hotel or apartment building that when all the apartments were full just added more apartment buildings to rent out. And that's kind of what a vector does. With an array, once you've you know used up each of the positions, there there aren't any more left. Now let's talk about one reason why you might want to use an array or a vector. And this will be well let's explain this example and then we're code it. And in this example, I want to show you a program that you can do if you have an array or a vector, but that practically speaking would be impossible without it. All right, so let's write a program, an example that needs to store its data while the program is running. To do that, let's talk about the example of a program that calculates the standard deviation of some values that you've input. First, let me remind you what the standard deviation is. The standard deviation is a measurement that tells you on average how far apart the values that you're examining are from the average. So let me show you what I mean. Let's say you took the average of these four values. What's the average of 5.5, 5.5, 5.5, and 5.5? And the answer is 5.5. Now, what's the difference between uh, 10 and 1 and 10 and 1? And the average there is 5.5. So they have the same average. What the standard deviation does is compare these values with the average. And in this case, it would tell you, oh, the average is very close to the values. And in this case here, it would tell you that this, the values are farther away from the average. So that's what the standard deviation measures. Now, how are we going to do that in a program? 
Well, previously we've written programs that calculate the average. And we did that by keeping a running sum, or total, and then a count of how many values we saw. And we just divided the sum by the count at the end of the program in order to figure out the average. Well, that works and worked fine in our programs when we just wanted to do the sum uh, or the uh, average because we could read the values in, update our values, and then discard that input and never need it again. But now, if we're trying to calculate the standard deviation, we have a very nice example that shows us that we need to retain the data. Because in order to calculate the standard deviation, we have to get all the values and calculate the average. But then, once we know the average, we have to go back and examine each of the values that were input to compare them against the average. So in effect, we need to go through all of the data that the user inputs, and then we have to go through it again. And it would be a horrible program that said, type in a bunch of values, and now, guess what? Type them all in again. So what we need to do is when the user inputs these values, is retain them, store them in the program, so that we can look at them again a second time. And the only practical way to do that is with an array or a vector. If you didn't have an array or a vector, you could make up single variables. Let's see, let's use doubles. And here's A, and here's B, and here's C, and so on. And then you could say double D. And so then you'd have four doubles, A, B, C, and D, to store those four values in. But what if the user wanted to enter three values, or five? Well, then maybe we add double E. Then you have a program that only works with three, five values. What if the user wants to enter 50 values or 5,000 values? And so there's no way that you can write a program that would be able to handle all of those cases. And so the only way to handle it is with a container, such as, in this case, we're going to use a vector that can take in an unspecified amount of data. You don't know how many pieces of data there's going to be and store them all and then allow you to retrieve them later. So that's what we're going to do in the sample program. Let me tell you a little bit about the vector. And I want to mention, let me tell you a little bit about the vector. The first is two useful commands on a vector are push back. And push back takes a piece of data and adds it to the end of the vector. So that will be in the first open spot or the first spot that you haven't used. The first piece of data that you add to a vector goes into position 0, and the second piece goes into position 1, and so on. And as we add more data, the vector will continue to grow and use more spaces to hold the data. The second command is the size command, and that will tell you how many pieces of data that you've put into the vector with the pushback command. So that's kind of equivalent to uh, in a string that tells you how many characters are there, the size command in a vector tells you how many pieces are there. <clears throat> the third thing we need to know is the square brackets. And the square brackets, when in combined with an index, give you back a particular position in the vector. So if we had a vector named v, then v2 would give us this particular value right here. In both arrays and vectors, making sure that the index is valid is extremely important. And if you use an invalid index, say a negative position, negative 1, or a value that comes past the end of your vector, that's going to cause serious problems in our program. And so we always want to make sure that the index is within the bounds of the array. That might mean using some if commands and checking the size. The last thing I want to show you about a vector before we start coding is that in order to declare one, we have to say that we want a vector, and then inside angle brackets, or greater than and less than sign, we need to say what kind of data that vector is going to hold, and then we need to give it a value. Uh, excuse me, and then we need to give it a name. So here we're going to make a vector named v that's going to hold doubles, and the type of it is vector double. So when we need to pass it to another function, for example, we'll call it a vector double. 
So those are the top four most important things to know about a vector, and knowing that is going to be enough to be able to write our program that does a standard deviation. Also, by the way, that's the minimum amount you need to know in order to complete the next programming assignment. Okay, well let's switch to our program now and code a program that works with the standard deviation. Okay, well here I've got a starter program called lecture14.cpp and I've compiled it and tested it just once to make sure it doesn't do anything. All right, now in order to use vectors in your program, you need to pound include vector. So I'll do that first. And now I would like to declare a vector. And to make it match my example on paper, I'll call it V. Okay, and let's output a message to the user. Enter doubles EOF to quit. Okay, let's add a temporary variable. Okay, and now let's input some doubles while temp. So that will allow the user to enter doubles, and now I want to take that double that the user has entered and store it inside of that vector. So I'm going to use the pushback command to do that. So here I will say v dot push back temp, and that says add this value to this vector here v. So this loop will continue as long as the user enter doubles, and when we drop out, then every value that the user has stored, uh, has input. When we drop out of this loop, then every double that the user has input will be stored in this vector. Okay, well now let's check to see the that the person has entered at least one value in it, and so here we'll say if v dot size is equal to zero, then we'll say C out, C out, you didn't enter any values. Otherwise, the standard deviation of your input is, and let's write a function, and we'll pass it our vector. To pass a vector to another function, you just have to give the name of the vector. That's really convenient. That's very nice. And because the vector is smart and has many capabilities, I've only listed a couple here, but we can ask the vector its size. So once we arrive in this other function, we'll be able to ask that vector, how many pieces of data do you have? And so we don't have to transmit that separately. Or notice here, our program doesn't even count to see how many values the user has input. That's because the vector is already going to know that. Because each time we push back, it increases its internal tracking of how big it is by one. Okay, well, let's add a function here called standard deviation. And this program receives one vector of doubles and here in the function, I'll call it v. Notice that this, this v here is a local variable to this and is different than the v that's in here. I could give it a different name, q, and code this program against that. Now, of course, both of these are not really very good variable names. v isn't very descriptive. Maybe I could have called it values. But in general, if V was a good name in this program, and in, the, excuse me, but in general, assuming that V was a descriptive name, 
in this part of the program, then it's probably also a descriptive name in this part of the pro program. So generally speaking, it's best practices to have the variables have the same name in functions as, but generally it's best practices to have variables in the functions that call other functions. But generally speaking, it's best practices to have a variable have the same name in both scopes to make it easier for the some a human being who's looking at the program to realize that um, the value from one to make it easier for a program to programmer who's but in general it's best practices for the variable to reuse the same name in both places so that a programmer who's looking at the program can more easily see that those two variables are related to one another somehow. Okay, before we go any farther, let's save the program and make sure, oh, let's add just the minimum, let's add just the minimum code to make this program compile. It has a return type of double, so it has to return a double or we'll get an error. And let's compile Oh, <laughs> I put while there. Okay, uh, CN. Perhaps you caught that several minutes ago when you were watching. All right, let's compile and run the program. And I can enter doubles. And notice there, oh, I don't like that it says it on the same line. <clears throat> and um, here, this should really probably be end line there. Okay, uh, that's just a minor quibble, though and control D, didn't enter any values, 3.4, 5.6, 7.8, control D, standard deviation of your input is zero. Okay, so the reason that I did that is I always like to put in, you know, minimum code for a new function, a stub, enough to get it to compile to make sure that it's connected, that everything's connected properly, and here we called the function, we got the zero back and we printed it out. Wanted to make sure that was all working. Now, if we're, if we're not convinced that that zero was really coming from here, then we can do one more test, negative 99.8765, and compile and run the program again, 4.5. And here we can see, okay, look, it really is connected. Okay, so now, we're ready to modify this function to calculate the standard deviation. Now, I'm going to show you the formula for the standard deviation when you um, have all of the values. If you were to look up standard deviation in uh, formula online, you'd probably most likely see a slightly different formula. That's because most of those examples are when you're trying to figure out the standard deviation of a population when you only know a sampling from that population. So the formula I'm going to show you works when you have all of your data, which is, you know, true in, in this example. All right, let me show you the formula that we're going to use to calculate the standard deviation. First, we're going to need to take the sum of each of the values in the container. We're going to have to subtract the average value and square that, and then sum all of those terms together divide by the size or the count and then take the square root of the whole thing. So a few different steps. You can also test your results in Microsoft Excel in many spreadsheets with this command standard deviation P. All right, first thing is let's figure out the size of this vector. We'll create a size variable. It's an integer. All right, let's add a sum variable. And now let's sum up all the values in the vector. Here I'll use a for loop for int i equals zero, i is less than size i plus plus. Sum plus equals v of i. Okay, so that should give us the sum 
of all of the values in the vector. Remember that a vector or array is indexed by integers starting at zero. And so one of the most common pairings in programming is the idea of using a loop and a vector or array together so that the loop can in turn give you the indexes of every element in the array or vector. And that allows you to perform an operation on every element in the array or vector, such as what I'm doing in the program here and calculating the sum. Let's add one more variable here and I'll call this the mean and I'll set that equal to be the sum divided by the size. Then as a temporary test, which we'll have to replace later, let's then return the mean and we can check our program to see if it looks like it's calculating the average so far. 1, 10, 1, 10, control D. Here it says, of course, the standard deviation it says, but so far we're just testing the mean and I get a value of 5.5, which is correct. So it looks good so far. Okay, well, now that we know the mean, we need to subtract that from each of the values in the array, square it, and then add that into a running total. Let's add a new variable here. I'll call it sum of terms. Coming up with good variable names can be difficult sometimes. So sum of terms, at least it tells you that it's a sum and that there's some kind of terms of an equation that we're summing up. Okay, and here I'll cut and paste this code that we've already got. The variable is called sum of terms, but what we want to add in is v i minus the mean, and we need to square that. We could use the pow function. But sometimes it's easier when you want to square something just to multiply it by itself. All right. And now to return the final value, we'll return the square root of the sum of terms divided by size. That should be the final result. Oh, by the way, a square root comes from the CMath library, and you might not have seen me add that in here. On some systems, it will actually automatically include CMath for you, but um, not on other systems. All right, let's save and recompile and run and enter doubles, 1, 10, 1, and 10. Standard deviation is 4.5. That's because that's on average how far those values are away. And let's try this again. And we'll try 5.5, 5.5, 5.5, and 5.5. Standard deviation is zero because they're all right at the average. Okay, well, that wraps up our first look at arrays and vectors. See you next time. Thank you.